Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. So yeah, hello. Um, I'm Martin. Uh, I'm going to talk about analyzing um, news events in non-traditional digital collections. Um, this is collaborative work with my spectacular uh, colleague Peter Bordel. Uh We're both at UCLA, so we're soaking all day and eating avocados for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Um, and, uh, but we're both part of the um, digital library program at UCLA. So in order to put this into perspective, uh, what I'm trying to talk about, um, um, I need to give you a little bit of background about um, what we're doing in the digital library program. So uh, we're collecting non-traditional um, uh, news events, really. Uh, so part of that is um, the International uh, Digitizing Ephemera Project. Um, uh, under which umbrella we have been gifted um, uh, non-traditional collections from uh, activists on the ground, for example, in 2009 at Tahrir Square um, during the Egyptian Revolution. We have received um, uh, material from uh, the Green Movement in Iran in 2011. And when I say non-traditional collections, what I mean by that is we have, for example, received thousands and thousands of uh, cell phone videos uh, uh, taken by activists on the ground. So how do you put this in a digital library? Well, uh, no good idea yet there. Um, we have um, received scanned images, as you can see here, flyers that were handed out uh, during those um, uh, events. Uh, we have also received a gift of social media collections, so Twitter in particular. And what I find particularly intriguing is the notion of uh, web server logs from activists uh, uh, in this area that potentially prove or indicate at least some malicious behavior by authorities. Um, so these are you know, uh, collections that we've, we've received somehow, you know, more or less incidentally. And uh, uh, we want to uh, build interesting services on top of that in order to facilitate research uh, on campus and beyond. So part of uh, my or our initiative in this context is, well, let's try to expand this already a non-traditional collection with the web content, right? There's this thing the web out there. So we have social media content, we have web content in general. We're trying to um, dive into more into web archiving. So let's enhance, enhance those collections with uh, social media content. So what we're doing there is uh, we're reusing uh, uh, existing tools to capture Twitter data in particular. Uh, we're using two tools. Uh, one uh, um, depicted on the bottom left is called the Social Feed Manager, um, uh, coming out of George W. Uh, George Washington, rather, but uh, that should not be the PI on that project. Uh, and that allows us to go forwards in time. So it's basically a capture mechanism. We start now and we grab everything going forward. The second tool we're using is, um, comes out of uh, MITH. Uh, Ed Summers is the, um, uh, the main developer on that one. It's called Twark, Twitter Archiving, I think. And that allows you to go backwards in time. So use the search API to uh, retrieve tweets uh, um, um, back to uh, seven, eight, nine days, whatever the Twitter API um, gets you. So and of course, we're in the business of web archiving, right? So we're uh, not only grabbing those tweets, we're also extracting uh, reference URIs and embedded content and push those proactively into web archives. In an archive and archive.is have this proactive archiving service that you determine you send them a URI and you basically ask them go come get it and, and archive it. So that's the um, the first part of the non-traditional collections. The second one is, and that's where uh, Pete and his experience uh, comes in, is what we call Newscape. That is an archive of uh, uh, TV broadcast news. We've been capturing TV broadcast news for the last um, 10 years. We have now over uh, a quarter of a million hours of TV news content archived. So that's not just the video, it's also the audio. And that's the really cool and unique thing about this. Um, so we get the closed captions from those uh, um, uh, news broadcasts. We get the official transcripts. And we do OCR on the screen. So we grab the on-screen text as well. And all of that is indexed in a solar index. Uh, almost 3 billion words by now. So you can search. And that's the cool thing here. You can search the entire corpus uh, uh, with a regular full text search. So these two pieces come uh, uh, together with uh, what we call solo glow because uh, the notion there is we're, uh, we're capturing local and global, so local and glow, uh, news content and combining that with social uh, um, uh, media with the uh, 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 social data, so hence um, solo glow. So uh, to give an example of um, uh, what we're trying to do here is um, overlapping these two collections. So how could that work? So I, I, I took an example, a tweet uh, sent in 2011 um, with the famous quote from Obama, 
saying the future of Egypt will be determined by its people. And a reference to a um, probably a video snippet from MSNBC. So if you would uh, follow that link today, you would end up here. So it doesn't exist anymore, it's a fall for. And interestingly enough, just as a side comment, you see the, uh, the banner up there in the front in red uh, talking about Bill Crosby. Well, clearly that was not in 2011, right? So that's a bit of a temporal lift, but that's just beside the point. That where I want to get to with this slide is that if we use this famous quote from Obama and search, use it as a search query against our Newscape collection, uh, we get the, uh, the news content, we get the news snippet, in this case, uh, exactly from MSNBC. So, uh, that's an example, a trivial example, but an example of how those um, in initially disjoint collections can be, can be overlaid, how um, you know, added value can be generated uh, if you take um, these initially silos and, and connect them. So that's basically our point here, how can we, <coughs> uh, how can we build um, uh, form advice disjoint collections and how can we uh, um, uh, build services uh, on top of that that, that uh, um, provide added value and merit to those, those collections. So what we did was we collected social media data uh, about a, a catastrophe that I'm sure you'll recall in uh, late December last year uh, an um, Air Asia flight crashed on its way from Surabaya to Singapore, uh, killed 155 people and uh, the flight number was uh, QZ8501. So we uh, used our tools that I mentioned previously to capture uh, Twitter data. We uh, aggregated a collection of a total of 7.3 million tweets from roughly a bit more than a million distinct users. And we captured this over a time frame of uh, roughly three weeks, give or take. What we then also did was, uh, oh, we, we um, did the, the uh, Twitter capture by uh, means of two terms. So we searched for all tweets that either contained the phrase AirAsia or the uh, flight number QZ8501. So these are our two uh, queries, query terms really. And uh, we use the same query terms against the Newscape uh, corpus, which as I told you is full text indexed. And we captured all, uh, or we isolated all mentions within Newscape. So everything that had been captured on uh, TV broadcasts. So that, these two pieces in, in our data set should give us a good idea of uh, um, what, this, um, um, what the coverage looks like. And then the notion becomes now how, to, how do we analyze that? How can we uh, gain knowledge from those collections in order to help uh, special collection builders uh, make sense of um, what we have and what we got? So this is an interesting plot that just uh, gives you a notion of frequency. So how often is the notion of AirAsia and the flight number mentioned on Twitter? So how many tweets have been sent? on an hourly uh, basis, and how often are those terms mentioned in the TV news. Uh, the blue line, um, and that's the first observation here really, the blue line, blue line represents the Twitter frequency, and the red line represents the TV news frequency. Um, looks very similar, however, you cannot read it, uh, because the, the scale is too small, oh, the, the font is too small, rather, the scale is vastly different. So our first peak uh, on uh, December 28th, uh, in blue, the Twitter peak is roughly 270,000 mentions within that particular hour. Uh, and uh, the, let's say, uh, follow-up uh, uh, peak on the TV news is uh, uh, roughly 100 mentions within, the, within that hour. So, you know, it gives you a difference of, or gives you a sense of uh, scale there. So, several observations are important. Uh, first is that Twitter spikes. Spikes very, very quickly. The spike that we see, the first uh, one is... Um, roughly at 4 a.m. in the morning, and that's all normalized over time, right? At 4 a.m. in the morning, and only 19 minutes prior to that, the airline had officially announced there's something going on here, the plane's missing, we don't know where it's at. So a fairly quick turnaround time. However, the TV news uh, coverage does not start until eight hours later. So there's, an, uh, there's a delay there that is significant, and that's an important finding from our point of view for special collections builders, right? So there's, there's a gap there that needs to be taken into consideration. The second observation from our point of view is that we have a second spike for Twitter right here on, uh, I think, December 30th, of course. And that, if you, uh, if you correlate that with real world events, that uh, is basically the time when the first wreckage was, uh, was cited, was found. So then again, Twitter spikes. So, but then basically levels off, nothing really uh, important from Twitter's point of view happens. However, you see the, uh, it's like an EKG, right, for, for the uh, uh, TV's news coverage. So they're really dictated by, or, or uh, motivated by, by schedule. So they have, uh, uh, have a new show coming up and they uh, uh, talk about it and they talk about it again and talk about it again. Uh, 
basically regardless of whether anything has happened, right? So that's um, um, uh, a pulsing, really, whereas uh, Twitter spikes correlated with real-world events. Um, one interesting aspect which I thought was uh, uh, neat. So this little spike right here, you may be able to see that for, uh, for Twitter. Um, it's also part of the, the collection building process, right? It has nothing to do with the crash. It was just there was a flight canceled and people started complaining like crazy. So that's a little uh, uh, peak there. But that's also what you get when you, co when, you collect, when you build those kind of collections, right? Right. Um, so then, if you, if you look at related research, what, um, what others have done looking at Twitter data, um, the notion um, uh, occurs that, oops, yeah, that uh, people tend to retweet tweets frequently just around the event. Right? So when, when something uh, dramatic happens, uh, fewer people actually create new content, but everyone is hitting retweet, or a lot of people do. And we uh, looked into our collection whether that's the same here, and uh, indeed we can, uh, green is horrible, uh, we can, we can uh, confirm that. So we see our two spikes from Twitter, and the green line just represents the retweet frequency of those tweets, and uh, basically the green ratio line spikes just as much as the, uh, the, the total number. So uh, a retweet ratio of 70 and 80% for our two tweets, or two spikes rather, uh, gives you a notion of, well, you're collecting a lot of tweets, but the uh, ratio of new content is actually uh, uh, much lower than you would expect by looking at the overall numbers only. And then it levels off somewhere between 10 and 30, 40% for the remainder of the uh, uh, coverage. Right? Okay. So then we started looking at, well, what do these two collections have in common? And then we looked at uh, sheer um, term frequency, looking at what kind of terms uh, occur in both corpora, uh, but with different frequencies. So these uh, five lines represent examples of terms that occur in both corpora, so both on Twitter and in the TV news coverage, but are more frequently used on Twitter. Right, so the, you see the, the fre frequency ranked on the left column. So the fifth most frequent term on Twitter that also occurs in the TV uh, uh, a corpus is the flight number, QZ8501. <laughs> That's something you, you'd expect because this you know, technical phrase might be more natural to Twitter than to the uh, TV bros, uh, broadcast news. Right? I mean, I'm breaking my tongue <coughs> pronouncing that, so uh, yeah, you can imagine that. So uh, if, you, if you look at those numbers, you have uh, very emotionally charged terms, right? so prayers, thoughts, condolences. So you get a notion there. This this might be uh, might be something there that uh, um, people on Twitter interact in an, uh, on a more personal level, so to speak. That could be one indicator. If you now turn this around, if you now take the terms that also occur in both um, uh, collections, however, are much more frequent in the TV news than they are in Twitter. Right. So basically, swap these two columns here, or the values rather. You see terms that indicate, you know. Uh, Serious journalism, like you talk about CEOs and uh, reporters and investigators, uh, questions being asked. So more, let's say, hard facts and terms that indicate uh, investigative journalism much rather than the uh, emotional uh, aspect on the uh, high frequency for, for Twitter. So that's uh, um, interesting. So for example, the uh, flight number, the, the QZ8501, is frequently used on Twitter. However, we find, uh, we find the, the, the phrase, the engram, really, of flight 8501 much more frequently used in the TV uh, um, data set than on Twitter. So it's a notion, you know, no one says QZ, they say, you know, flight 8, and so on. So, so on. All right, so then what we did next, and it's our uh, uh, fourth and uh, um, last experiment in this context, is the notion of well, where do these terms occur first? The uh, theory behind it, or the idea behind this experiment was, well, how do these uh, two disjoint media uh, influence each other, right? Does Twitter start some trend and then it's being picked up on TV or the other way around? So what's the deal? Um, this graph shows you the frequency of, uh, or the total amount of terms that occur in blue bars on Twitter first. Uh, and the number of terms is represented by the height of the bar and the uh, delay in hours uh, on the on the x-axis. So to give you an example, this bar, for example, right here, uh, um, one, two, three, four. So 40 terms occur on Twitter first, and uh, four hours later they occur in the uh, TV broadcast news. Um, 
So the, the, the first um, idea that you get, and if I stretch this out over the entire span that we looked at it, uh, the first ob uh, observation you realize, well, blue is dominant, right? So the vast majority of terms occur in 2 to the first, <coughs> then are we picked up on TV. Uh, See, so maybe if you, if you cluster this somehow, right? So it's summer, there's a lot of terms that occur, let's say, within the first 13 hours or, or something like that. This could be explained by the delay that I mentioned earlier, that TV news uh, does not catch up with the, with the real news uh, for eight hours or so. Um, but you see, there's, there's hardly any terms that occur on uh, TV first and then on Twitter. So there's several um, theoretical explanations for that, right? So if you look at the terms that occur on Twitter first, um, you have these things like uh, um, missing or breaking and, and uh, uh, officials. and So those, those terms that people would in initially use for um, uh, uh, explaining a catastrophe and then are being picked up 8 hours, 10 hours, 13 hours later on TV. But then you also have a lot of terms that you know, occur 50, 60, 100 hours later on TV. So what's that about? Well, we can only speculate, Lee, but if you look at the terms, they are uh, of speculative uh, character. So there's tails as an airplane tail. And what else do we have? We had sighting and chances. So maybe an explanation could be that people on Twitter start speculating about things and pick up rumors, really, uh, which don't make it necessarily to the TV coverage uh, up uh, until uh, way later where it actually happens or it's been discussed because they're running out of new material to cover. That could be another example. Yeah. So one interesting um, aspect is the notion that there's hardly anything that um, is uh, coined really on TV first and then makes it to Twitter. One example is uh, Costello, the term Costello, and it's, uh, I'm sure you'll be aware that this is a popular CNN anchor. At some point Twitter realized how oh, there's some CNN anchor, so maybe we should mention her name as well. Um, so for me, the, uh, um, the most amusing fact is the hashtag that occurred on TV first and then on Twitter. When I saw that, I thought there was something wrong with our analysis. But no, that's not true. The hashtag 8501QS was actually not coined on Twitter, it was coined by CNN. Uh, where the news anchors asked the audience, hey, send us questions by using this hashtag. And then people did. And so that's another example of how these uh, completely disjoined uh, media really influence each other and then overlap in a way. So all these um, uh, interesting indicators really for um, builders of those special collections. All right, so maybe to, to wrap up, um, there is, we have a set of experiments that you know, don't give you um, hard scientific methods of how to build so those special collections, how to interpret them. However, um, I think a series of experiments you have shown a couple of things that could be important for, uh, for, for building those collections. First is um, the uh, frequency of mentions varies uh, dramatically. Right? So, Twitter, as we've seen, a uh, quarter of a million or even more mentions within an hour, and uh, uh, the TV uh, spikes were at like 100 or something. Like we've seen a delay uh, of, uh, of coverage, so uh, Twitter uh, uh, responds to real world catastrophes much, much quicker than, it, than the TV news do. And that uh, you know, may vary by, by location, really, uh, but we have fairly international coverage on the TV, so um, our numbers show something between uh, um, six and ten hours, so eight hours maybe. And um, the, the, the Twitter attention really spikes close by, nearby to the, to the event, and uh, um, um, the, the news coverage seems to be more dominate, dominated by, uh, by scheduling. Um, and then continues uh, on a fairly high level versus, versus you know, Twitter really tails off and uh, there's, there doesn't seem much uh, interesting um, talk to talk about that anymore. We've seen indicators that these two collections or these two uh, 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 data sets really over, overlap and influence each other. So the hashtag example, the Costello example, uh, the, the example of uh, uh, terms with a speculative character making it into, uh, basically sneaking into the other collection. Um, and then we've also seen indicators that terms on social media may in, uh, infer a bit more of an um, uh, emotional character, and so those terms occur uh, more, more so on Twitter than they do on social media. I realize that was pretty quick, but uh, uh, thanks a lot for your attention. I'm happy to take your questions.